Whoops. So this arrived. Cool, huh? I guess it's Voron time. No, not this one. This one. Let's go. So the first question is, why am I doing this? Why is Lost in Tech Guy building a Voron? I suppose the answer is because FYSETC asked me if I wanted to try a Voron Zero kit, and I would have been frankly insane to say no. So here's the kit in question. Actually, the first question is probably, what on earth is a Voron? Because I realise I'm assuming everyone knows because so many people who are on our Discord and just generally the people I talk to day to day, they know because these are people who are seriously interested in 3D printing. If you're new to 3D printing, then a Voron is a rather no compromises self-build printer that originally you would have had to source all the parts from a bill of materials, not a kit. But thankfully, a few manufacturers have provided kits, which are basically just a bill of materials in a box. That kind of brings it down to sort of almost like building a Prusa. I think most sane people would recommend doing it this way because unless you're really good at sourcing parts or you enjoy going through spreadsheets of part numbers, then this is easier. This is a lot easier. The premise of the Voron Zero is, well, this paragraph on their front page here. It's highly regarded by Voron owners as one of the best printers you can get, and I'm sure you absolutely wouldn't think otherwise, having spent tens of hours building one and spent the money on one. But seriously, we'll see, won't we? Because I plan to poke around at this thing rather than just build it, and I want to show you along the way how I'm building it and why it's clever and well designed. This is the first episode, and don't start. I know I've got a bit of a history with regards to first episode. Um, this part is me showing you what is in the kit and how I'm going about the project and some gratuitous lack table footage maybe, but it's all a bit quick and dirty because mainly, uh, unlike a lot of the stuff I do on this channel, this one is me documenting some actual hard work that I'm doing. So I'm filming it as and when it happens rather than sort of, you know, staging it afterwards, as I might do in a review. Um, you, there's a lot of that goes on, believe it or not. When you when you normally edit, you go back and you say, oh, well, I haven't got a good shot of this, so you have to take things apart and do it again. So in this case, I'm not doing that. Stuff will be missing. I will have lost footage, no doubt. Things will be out of focus. Things will be portrait and landscape when they should be landscape and portrait. We'll just have to see what happens. We'll, we'll play it by ear. Uh, and it's ongoing. As I read this script, I'm still, I'm still doing it. We have all manner of parts that I'll annotate on screen during the editing because, uh, as I said, I'm reading the script before I rewatch, and that throws off my usual video process. There's just no way of dealing with this level of unboxing. So let's just put some music on and I'll jump in awkwardly during the edit if I have anything to say with a different voice, I suppose, because that's how that works. The kit you see here is without printed parts, which means you have to print the parts, obviously. So what parts are we talking about? You're not printing hardware, you're printing the bits that hold the hardware together, arguably. I'm, I mean, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. The list of parts you have to print for a Voron Zero is on GitHub, and I will link it below, or I'll forget, in which case you can access it easily from the Voron website, which I will link below, or also forget. The parts list can look foreboding, and it sort of is. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, a lot of parts to print. I guess it'd be like about a hundred, to be honest. Um, at the time of editing, I'm not even finished printing the parts. Here is my increasing pile of parts. I am getting there, but more on that later. Vor on that later. I found the best way to tackle printing them was actually to move the parts themselves into subfolders for build plates. You can do it however you want. You just have to get the parts printed. But I think organisation is absolutely necessary rather than just ploughing in and starting doing it. In terms of print settings, it's in the manual on the first page. Just use the settings they give you. In terms of material, well, again, it's on the first page of the manual. You can't use PLA. You shouldn't use PETG. I mean, you might get away with it, but People have had bad experience, including Stefan from CNC Kitchen, who tried to do his out of PETG, I think, and had to go back and do it again. I think it was PETG. But anyway, unfortunately, this is the deal breaker for some of us, and it was a deal breaker for me until very recently. 
The Voron parts need to be printed in a material that has a low creep and high glass point, and that means a material that's not good to print in the house, or at least not good to print around where you're breathing. I chose to use ABS, but a lot of people choose ASA. They're kind of equivalent, both are horrendously bad for your health, you can argue all day long about how safe these materials are, we've, we've had these arguments on social media. The argument is fairly dumb to be honest, it's about the same level of dumb argument as arguing that smoking isn't harmful because you've been doing it all your life and you're fine. Do not print ABS or ASA in the same room as your breathing air is kept in, it's quite simple. For me that did present a problem, but the solution was to use the garage, and yes that's how we say it in the UK. Now for people who share the same hemisphere as me, it's currently winter. If your garage is anything like mine, that means it's currently cold in your garage. Solution? Enclosure. You kind of need an enclosure anyway to print ABS, so not a huge difference there, but the quickest, cheapest and probably least responsible way to make an enclosure is with an IKEA LAC. This is the cheapy table that IKEA sells. I decided I wanted everything inside the enclosure, including the spool of filament, which turned out to be a great choice as you'll see in a moment, but to achieve that I had to buy three LACs, and here's an awful drawing of the layout to how I made that work. Also, I messed up my elbow last time I assembled a lac. We're kind of wandering off topic here, aren't we? But the idea of putting legs on three lacs was not sitting well with me. They, they really do mess up your arm. So I made this. You can find this on printables in case I also forget to link it below. I do have a habit of forgetting to link things. This thing, if I can blow my own trumpet for a moment, um, which I'm going to, no one could stop me, this thing is amazing. IKEA, if you're listening, you need to put one of these in every package with a table inside it, even if it increases the cost by £12. Just do it, seriously. Also, I had to print these things out to hold the legends together. Sorry, leg ends. Uh, these work fine, but if you're planning on making an enclosure like this, print these at 104% because they don't fit at standard size. I surrounded the enclosure with this foam that I keep getting free with printers because it's free. You can pretty much use anything, it turns out that you don't really need the insulating capabilities or properties, you just need draft mitigation. The printer I chose to print these parts with is the Sovol SV06, which I'm sure if you've visited this channel before you will be aware of that printer, but it is all metal and it has a maximum print temp of 300 degrees C and a maximum bed temp of 100 degrees C and with the PEI plate and it's about the right size to fit inside the lac and it has less parts to get angry about being out in the cold for. So I chose that one for printing the parts, and it was ostensibly the right choice because it has done an amazing job, but we'll talk at the end about that. Because we're printing ABS, and I got these two reels of ABS from eSun, which a lot of people have used, the eSun ABS Plus, I didn't want to rock the boat, so I just bought it. I decided to also use glue stick on the PEI bed, and that actually turned out to be a decent choice because it did work really well. Now being in the garage, in the cold, you're probably wondering how that, that whole thing went. And I did take quite a bit of data actually. The outside temperature for almost all of the print so far has been, frankly, horrible, with ice and temperatures below zero. We're having what they call in the UK, I mean, this is like the weakest name for a weather um, phenomenon ever, we're having a cold snap. The garage itself had been around 0 to 5 degrees Celsius, um, that does sound like an absolute nightmare for ABS, and I'm sure it is. The SV06 hilariously refused to believe the thermistor on the bed, and it was regularly telling me there must be a mistake and it would refuse to operate. I couldn't possibly be stupid enough to try and print it at that temperature, so it must be a mistake, it must be an error in the thermistor, but nope, I really am trying to print at 0 degrees C. With the bed set to 100 degrees C and a print temperature of 250 to 260 for the ABS, the inside ambient air was hanging around barely 20 degrees C, so basically it was a room temperature enclosure. But you know what? It worked fine. I think there's a lesson to be learned here, and that is to be selective about established knowledge. You can see that my prints are perfectly fine as a result of this technique, if you can call it a technique. And I think that the reason why it's perfectly fine when it shouldn't be at that kind of conditions is because the enclosure is stopping any drafts, even though it's not exactly airtight, but it's stopping, stopping gusts of wind from cooling the part. And... It can't maintain a high temperature, but it still works fine, so obviously that's not 
a priority. It's more about the drafts. I did initially suffer some of the classic shrinkage-based cracking that you see a lot, uh, but a bit of research and... The internet told me to turn the part cooling fan down to 5% and that absolutely solved the layer shrinkage issues totally. It will have increased the stringing a little bit, but honestly, it's fine. Look at these. You would struggle to convince someone that this was done in a freezing garage with the $250 off-the-shelf printer. And I find that quite interesting. So what next? Hopefully in part two, I will be finishing up printing and discussing any issues I may or may not have had during the printing. Make sure you're subscribed if you want to catch the next episode. As usual, comment if you have any advice or tips on what not to do so I can do exactly that. And I will catch you in part two. Thank you for watching. Thank you.